everybody, and welcome to episode 84 of the I Rock Knits podcast. It is late Sunday afternoon, November 7th. Happy birthday to my husband, who turned 61 today. He is a pretty low-key guy, unlike me, high drama and emotion. <laughs> and uh, he's quiet and unassuming and um, doesn't want to make a big deal out of birthdays. We are going to go out to dinner with Kylie this evening um, and meet her and I have a pair of hand-knit socks to give him and a little car trivia book. And then we went down to a local men's store on Friday late afternoon and got him a new shirt and a sweater, something he can wear for casual and for work. Um, so that's kind of nice. If you are a resident of the Minneapolis area, the Twin Cities, Billy's Toggery in Shakopee is kind of an unknown gem. So if you have a, a gentleman in your life and you have never been down to Bill's Toggery, it's an old fashioned men's store where they provide just amazing customer service. They get to know you by name. They know your size and what you like. Um, they also have a big and tall, um, bigger men's section. So um, a lot of the Minnesota Vikings shop there um, or bigger, you know, really tall people, um, you know, the basketball players, Timberwolves and things like that. Um, it's not fancy. It's just really nice. And next door, there's a tiny little women's boutique. So um, just kind of a hidden gem, something that you don't see that often anymore. Right. Um, old fashioned men's clothing store. It's a second generation Billy's dad. Um, I think he goes by Bill the second. But anyway, so uh, welcome today to everyone. Come on in for a hug. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> Whoever thought that it would go on this long when we first got locked down in March that, you know, a year and a half ago, going on two years in March. Um, I do have a bit of a medical update of um, of what went on in my life this last week. So my parents came to visit last Sunday. Um, my mom had a three-year spinal fusion checkup, right? So she has had 27 surgeries in her lifetime. We've talked about this before. Um, lots of orthopedic issues and they fused her back, but then that failed, you know, the top and bottom eventually blow out of your spine after you've had have some stuff fused because those tops and bottoms get lots of extra pressure. So they literally made, built her a support and, and went in through the front and the back and built her pelvis. You guys probably remember that story. So um, she came up for her three-year checkup and on Sunday we were watching the Sunday night football game and she seemed a little off, just not herself. Um, and I, I just noticed a little bit. Um, she seemed overly tired, and that is a that's a whole other thing that I'm going to tell you about later. But um, Monday, I took her to uh, the local department store, Von Mauer, in our mall, and dropped her off for an hour and a half. That's her favorite place, and uh, I had a massage. And I had told her, I said, "Hey, I don't want to cancel because every time I cancel, then it gets backed up." And I only go about every six weeks, and it was on my schedule. And she said, "That'd be great. I'd be love to be dropped off." So I dropped her off, and we had gone to lunch. We had uh, Panera. We had just picked up, you know, Panera, and she was missing some words. Like she wasn't um, being re really clear, um, kind of slurring a little bit, and that, you know, concerns me. And, um, but when I got to pick her up at Von Mauer, uh, the clerk brought her out the, down the elevator from, ex elevator from upstairs. And she was carrying her back brace and I said, why are you carrying it? And she said, well, I forgot it. I tried on a shirt and I said, oh, okay. And I said, where's your cane? Because um, she likes to walk with a cane now because it kind of keeps people from bumping into you. And, um, and she said, oh, I left it. So I said, okay, I'll put you in the car. Cause I had pulled up. And the clerk said, I'll go back up and get it. So she got in the car and and she seemed just exhausted. And I thought, oh, that was too much. I shouldn't have had her do both things. Um, and we had dinner plans later that day. And so the, I went back in, the lady brought me the cane and um, I put it in the car. And then I went through the McDonald's drive through to get us a Diet Coke. And she's like, oh, my daughter's treating me so well. And I thought, maybe she's just tired, right? Because she was 
talking to me about it was so nice to get a fountain pop and we drove home and then she took a nap she fell asleep in the afternoon and then we went out to dinner and at supper she was really struggling um she just her words weren't always coming like the sentence would start but the word wasn't there and um I said to her my mom's cousin is who we went to dinner with um I, I'm sure you noticed that something, you know, something's going on with mom. And she said, yeah, I, I had no idea. And I said, I, I didn't really. So I had mentioned to my dad in the afternoon that mom seemed to be much worse than when I saw her three weeks ago. And he said, yeah, I agree. Something's going on. Um, but she made a comment in the car that didn't seem related to the con conversation we were having. And I was concerned. But dad said something like, you know, we'll go in after we get home from here. Tuesday morning, we woke up. Um, she had, Her point was at two. She had to have x-rays and stuff. We had to be in Burnsville, Minnesota. Um, and my dad hollered down and he said, Corey, I think you need to come up here. I think we need to go home. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I went running up the stairs and when she woke up, she couldn't talk and she couldn't walk. She couldn't get out of bed. And I will just let you all know now that she's okay, but um, this turned into an unfortunate bunch of events where we had a little argument, discussion about what should be done in the moment, and I didn't have my phone, and I said, we need to call 911. Yeah, we probably do. And by this point, she had gotten her words, and I said, Mom, it doesn't look like your face has fallen. Can you lift your arms up for me? As she could. We gave her an aspirin, a baby aspirin, because my dad takes those. And she said, I, as a nurse, I think I should probably be seen. And I said, okay. I ran downstairs to get my phone, and by the time I got back upstairs, they were putting a shirt on over her pajamas and saying, we think we should just drive her to the ER. And I said, okay. Um, Dad, you get dressed, and I'll sit here. And I just sat there with her, and then... Because we are pretty close to the, to the, an, a local ER here, um, it's probably a ten minute drive. Um, it's it's a not a hospital, but it's an ER. And so um, I said, okay, I'll run down and get dressed. And Dad's moving fast, I'm moving fast. And when I got back upstairs, they had decided that they didn't want to go to the ER. So we weren't calling nine one one. We weren't going to the ER. They wanted to go home. They wanted to go to Sioux Falls and be at their own hospital with Mom's own doctors. And I disagreed um, 100%. It was really scary, um, really frustrating. And um, there is no arguing with my father um, in that moment. And they are adults and can make their own decisions, but I should have dialed 911. But mom said, I'm just afraid that they'll put me in the hospital and we'll be stuck up here. And dad you know, won't be home and I won't be with my doctors and she does have a lot of doctors. And so I threw all their stuff in two suitcases, I carried them down to the car and put them all in the car within, this all happened within 15 minutes. Like it, it just, and I stood in the driveway with tears. Um, mom was crying, dad was crying, upset um, because they, they knew that they, this is probably not what they should be doing. Um, and then I sat and prayed for four hours while they drove to Sioux Falls. Um, and I, I explained to Dad that there is an ER in St. Peter, Mankato, Wyndham, Worthington, like within a half an hour of each of their the cities along the road, that if something would happen to her, there's an ER. And he said, yep, I know. Yep, we drive right by them. I know where they're at. So I let them go. Um, and I said, I do not agree with this decision. Um, I don't think this is the right choice, but they really wanted to go home. So they did and they made it and they drove right to the ER and I called my brother as soon as they left and I he um, works uh, as a city planner in Sioux Falls. And I said, Jeff, um, mom and dad are on their way. Mom has had a TIA or a stroke um, or something's going on and they wouldn't stay here. And so he went to their driveway. He left and sat in their driveway because my biggest fear was that they would get there and she would be feeling better and they might not go in. Um, and I know they were both scared too. Um, so he called me a couple hours later and said, I'm in their driveway, <laughs> um, just waiting to see if they show up here. And so then when I thought that they should be hitting Sioux Falls, it's about a three hour drive, three and a half hours. Um, I said, uh, I called and mom said, we're, we're just hitting Sioux Falls and we're going straight to Avera. 
And they did, and they admitted her, and she um, ran, they ran a ton of tests, and her blood pressure was super high, like skyrocketing high. Mom's never had high blood pressure. So to make a long story short, um, on Wednesday, her blood pressure spiked to 240 over 170, and she had a bunch of doctors who were rounding in the room, and they were there for an hour trying to get it down, they finally did. Um, and she was really scared. She said in that moment when they couldn't get it to come down, she thought she was gonna die. And um, they found a fungus on her brain, in her sinuses. Whether or not that is all related to the TIA, I, I, there, there was no bleeding on the brain, it showed no sign of that, but sometimes those don't show up. Um, she had cardiology, she had neurology, she had orthopedic, she, I mean, Mom has that nutcracker syndrome where she can't swallow very well. And she often, if she doesn't tuck her chin when she swallows because her flap doesn't close, this is way too much information. Um, anyway, so they had a physical therapist in, they had occupational therapy, physical therapy. They brought everybody in and she's home um, and she's on medications. They wanted to do a biopsy of this fungal um, infection to see what kind it was, to know what kind of antibiotic to treat it with but they did some type of procedure where they went up um, through her nose and sprayed it and did added medication not very very uncomfortable um, but she is seeing an ENT um, and her primary care doctor as soon as she gets you know now that she's home she has an appointment I think Monday um, anyway so it, it was super stressful and um, yeah it, it, in the moment when you're under stress you need to have a plan and that's what we've talked about since then is that the person who is ill should not be making the decisions about what is happening in the moment because mom was not perfectly coherent and so for her to be helping us make that decision was wrong but I was not willing to burn my relationship bridges with them to fight them and have them be angry that has happened two other times in my life where I have made a stand that was, I felt was my stand to make and it might not have been. And, um, you know, and there were a lot of hard feelings. So I guess the moral of the story, this long story here at the beginning is you need to make a plan with, with your people. If you are, you know, of retirement age or maybe even not, you know, do you have a plan? Have you talked to people out above about where you will go and who will help make those decisions for you? It was really stressful. And now in hindsight, they both agree that it might not have been the best choice. Nothing happened on the way in the car, but it could have. If her blood pressure would have spiked in the car, it, it could have been fatal. And they feel really bad that they put me through that now. Um, and, you know, I told dad, it's it's over, it's done. I have to move on from the fact that I was frustrated and scared um, for hours, um, but very stressful. And she didn't make it to her doctor's appointment, I had to call and cancel um, the, the doctor's appointment. So now they will have to redo that at some point. But this has been really, really stressful because I wanted to follow them, I wanted to drive them, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that. And I didn't know if I should be going down or not, if, if it was gonna be serious. And now she's home, like they just, they just released her. They never really gave her a firm diagnosis other than this fungal thing she has going on, which they're you know treating with medications, but they need to get rid of it. But so weird, so weird. And then it, did that cause the blood pressure? And the blood pressure, her heart was fine. Her All her blood levels came back fine, all of it. And when I talked to her on the phone on Wednesday night, full sentences, not losing her words, not slurring, stronger voice. It was incredible. I don't know if this had been coming on for a while, but I just couldn't believe. How I said, "Mom, you you like you sound like I like firm and confident, like your words and everything." It was a completely different situation, and and that's it's hard to see your parents' age. Anyway, so we'll just start with that little update, and I'll try to edit it down a little bit from how much I actually talked. We're a few minutes in. Have you noticed? Or did you just think I'd gone back in time? I got my old glasses back. <laughs> it was like coming home. 
honestly. I got a call from the eyeglass store um, in Edina um, that they had gotten some orange glasses in. And so I went over and uh, tried on different pairs and decided that it really wasn't for me. And I said, you know, I'm just, I'm still stuck on the fact that I, I'm missing my old glasses. And she said, well, did we try to get them for you? I said, yeah, they've been discontinued and, you know, whoever was looking for them and I and I had looked too and she goes let me just do some checking there are probably some stores that carry Fossa Foss which is the brand name that might still have them available and she called and she's like I found your glasses it's like the next day I said you got to be kidding this is what I love about these glasses they have springs in them they are so comfortable on my face they hit right where my dark circles under my eyes are. <laughs> and it is not as if I won't wear my raspberry ones anymore, but boy, did I miss these coming back to <laughs> my old orange and maroon glasses. I know they say that you shouldn't continue to wear your hair the same way year after year after year, so I probably shouldn't continue to wear the same pair of eyeglasses for five years, but... I put them on and I haven't taken them off since. So I just thought I should. Let's talk about the two audiobooks I read this, uh, listened to this last week. I listened to House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. It was quite good. I am not a fantasy, contemporary fantasy fan. I usually don't read things like that, but I've been seeing a lot of people reading this. And it is about people in society who are different. So there's a huge overreaching metaphor in this book. And if you read the book, the entirety of the book with uh, the in the back of your head, uh, the societal piece of people not fitting in, people who are different than everyone else, um, people who are trying to fight for their rights and their freedoms, um, it it takes on a whole different meaning and I it, it is, possibly in a young adult book but you might not get all of that underlying so here's the premise linus baker is a by the book caseworker in the department in charge of mag magical youth he's taxed with determining whether six dangerous magical children are likely to bring about the end of the world arthur parnassus is the master of the orphanage he would do anything to keep the children safe even if it means the world will burn and his secrets will come to life is an enchanting love story masterfully told about the profound experience of discovering an unlikely family in an unexpected place. It was best book of the year for Amazon, Chicago Tribune. Um, it, yes, highly enjoyable 12 hour book. I, um, I was enchanted, kind of entranced by the story. And then I kept coming back to this feeling of this is you know, orphanages where we place people who are on the outskirts of society, people who are different and don't fit in. Um, it was, it's, it's very, really quite good. I would highly recommend. And then I read The Dirty Life by Kristen Kimball. This is an older book that did not hold up as well over time. She makes some errors in political correctness <laughs> um, because it is definitely a little bit outdated. Um, it was written in 2011 and there were just a few times when I was like, oh, I don't think she should say that. Um, but other than that, it's a wonderful story. Single, 30-something and working as a writer in New York City, Kristen Kimball was living life as an adventure. But she was beginning to feel a sense of longing for a family and for home when she interviewed a dynamic young farmer her world changed kristen knew nothing about growing vegetables let alone raising pigs and cattle and driving horses but an on an impulse smitten if not yet in love she shed her city self and moved to 500 acres near lake champlain to start a new farm with him so it's the story of their starting a farm um, in upper new york uh, and the hardships of that and what it was like um, raising animals and planting crops. And um, they do ha end up having a, a real successful life, but it was just a, a very interesting story. I like books like that where people are 
carving out uh, space for themselves kind of off grid. So those are the two audiobooks I read this week. I made meatloaf this week, so let's talk about a recipe quick. Um, I was looking for a meatloaf glaze, something for the top of the meatloaf to give it some flavor. And so I was out on the internet just looking. I had meatloaf mix in my freezer and I don't often have that. And I was trying to use up some meat that I have. So it's that beef, pork, and veal mixture. And I made two and froze one, cooked them both and then froze one. But this classic meatloaf recipe from the Food Network Kitchen had just a delicious glaze. So it was brown sugar ketchup and Worcestershire sauce in a bowl and then you spread it over the top. It was really delightful. Very, um, you know, a sweet glaze Worcestershire kind of mellows it out and the ketchup is kind of tomatoey and so it's it's two eggs um cup of dried breadcrumbs an onion garlic ketchup you know it's your traditional meatloaf mix but the glaze really makes it so if you are a meatloaf fan for me there's nothing like leftover meatloaf on a sandwich the next day for lunch I know not everyone's a fan of meatloaf, but this one was really good and that glaze was delicious. So I thought, well, I'll just share that quick this week. Okay, the sweater of the week this week is hanging on the mannequin back there and I have cowls of the week this week. So let me share. Um, what I am wearing is a Gudrun Johnson dress. It has little pleats in the front right here. It's made of kind of a woven um, material and um, I had this sweater on over it, but I thought it would be easier to show the items if I left them on the mannequin. So let's start with my new pattern. I'm most excited about coming you to, to you today because I have a new pattern to share. This is a collaboration with Sharon of Knit Style Yarns, and I am tickled because those of you that have been watching the podcast for a while know that Sharon sent me these mini skeins, right? All the bright colored mini skeins that were named for all of the segments of the Corey Stories podcast. Um, so the Keep It Colorful pink is the one in the front, and then the Waddle On green, and the Keep Your Fork blue, the Corey's Colors orange, and the Corey's Stories purple. This is a Merino Nylon DK Mini Skein set. Each one is a 20 gram mini, and when she sent it to me, I was just tickled. The colors just spoke. I said at the moment, I said, I'm going to have to decide something with this. So many months later, I got in touch with Sharon and I said, I would like to design with those mini skeins. Can we put a um, kind of a color with it, like a main color? Um, and I'll see what if I what I can come up with. And when you get DK minis, they're um, 49 yards each, about 50 yards. And so you're getting, you know, quite a bit of yards, but not enough to really make a shawl with DK minis. When you have fingering minis, you can do a shawl with a one or two extra skeins. So we decided to keep the price point down and do a 50 gram um, main color mini so that you could just put the 50 gram with the minis and have a smaller project. And so, so this is the Corey Stories cowl. Maybe I should hold it up this way. It's a blowing out a little bit. That's the orange. That's not, they're not, they're bright, but they're not neon. They're not neon. There's the green. And then you get this speckled color that has all the little colors in it. A little bit of purple, a little bit of green um, in this cream. And then she also has it in uh, a second colorway in the gray. So I came up with this idea to do a cowl where you cast on here and you work your way up and you have these edge stitches which are seven stitches of knit slip knit slip knit slip knit slip and then you pick up the purple and you go across in just a little rib right here and then you get over here and you do knit slip knit slip knit slip knit and you go back and forth and Sharon's first response was oh Corey intarsia and lace and color work I, this is intarsia, but if you have ever changed colors by striping something, that's all that you're doing, is you're just changing colors. You're picking up the next color from underneath and working, and 
just the other day, Sharon got in touch and said, Corey, I just started knitting the cowl and you're right, it isn't hard. <laughs> it seems like it might be hard. But do you guys follow Gigi Made It on Instagram or do, do you know of her? Um, she says, it's not hard, it's new, right? It's just something new. Do not be afraid. I don't design hard things, but I really wanted to have this really nice edge along here. It's kind of a stockinette edge. And you just pick up your yarn from underneath when you get back to it. So you do divide your 50 gram skein into two. And I did have one tester do it in just two colors. She had a, a DK weight skein and you can do it one less panel. So this is five, you can do it in four if you want your cowl to fit a little more closely or you could add six or seven um, and, and loop it double. So you, you could kind of do it that way. So you start out with just this little reverse stockinette, you know, pearl bumps all the way. And you ha just have two balls attached um, of this color, one on each side. So yes, is there a little yarn management going on? Yes, but no more so than if you stripe a hat or you stripe a shawl or you're, you're striping something and you're going back and forth and you have balls of yarn attached. They're just sitting there, right? You're, you're only using this, and this is super simple. It's like knit four, yarn over, knit two together, knit four, and then knit five, knit six, knit seven, knit five, four, three. It's super simple. Makes these little chevrons, and then you do a little rib, and then you do chevrons again, and then you're done with that, that mini. This is so fun to knit. It is, you always have something to work on and honestly, you're not tied to the pattern. My patterns are always checklist patterns, so I write out every row for you so you can just keep track as you go. But once you've done this much, you have it. Like you know that the yarn over has to move over one and then it has to move back over one. And this was just super fun to knit. I had trouble getting testers to sign up to knit it too because they were like, oh man, I don't know, intarsia and lace. You guys, you're gonna have a beautiful little cowl when you're done. It's just lovely. If I put the orange in front, I could put this on. And if you only do, you know, four, I don't know if I can show you, then it would, you know, it would snug up around your neck closer. But I kind of like that it lays down. You can put any color you want in the front. So let me show you the second. Because I know that not everyone is a fan of the bright colors, I asked Sharon uh, pretty far along in the process if we could do another colorway. And she was like, yes, let me do some fall colors, some really pretty, softer colors. So we use the gray here, a gray. And then she's got the kind of golden, the soft blue, the soft pink, the soft orange, and the soft green. So the kits will be available in Sharon's shop. And I really want you to go over and support her. She's got beautiful yarns. She has a great sense of color. She has a podcast that she does with her husband. So you can go over and check that out as well. But really go support her. Um, even if you don't want to do mini skeins, she has fingering weight yarn in the shop. She has beautiful Christmas colors in the shop. Um, all kinds of stuff going on. But this is the second iteration, and I do, I like the soft one too. I just think it's very lovely. And I am going to give newsletter subscribers a coupon code, so that will go out on Monday along with the podcast. But if you watch my podcast right away, first two days, and you wanna go over and use the coupon code FREE, F-R-E-E -E on Ravelry, I will give it to you for free if you're watching it in the first two days of the podcast coming out. That means on the 9th and 10th of November, because giving it away to a few folks helps it move up in the algorithm. If you can't afford to buy it after the fact, the coupon code is in my newsletter and you're getting 50% off. Um, you can also always just queue it, put it in your queue on Ravelry. You can Put a little favorite heart on Ravelry on the page of the pattern. There's a save in favorites and it's, there's a little heart there and you can click on that. 
or you can just open it to the project page and open it on Ravelry. And all those things help move it up to the front page. And I want this kit to do really well for Sharon because I've never collaborated with her before. And I really want it to do, you know, I, I want it to, to do well for her. When you design something, you want people <laughs> to like your design, but that's just on you. But when you get yarn from someone and you want it to shine in, in a project, so I'm really excited about the kind of the stained glass window look of this and how it how it turned out. And I promise you that you can all knit it. It is, you know, it's not very wide. There aren't very many stitches to go over and back on. So it, it, it goes quite quickly. It's not a giant shawl with 200 or 300 or 400 stitches. You could certainly add more colors, add your favorites. You could make this section shorter if you wanted to just do one repeat of, of the lace and then do an, so there are all kinds of ways to make it your own. If you don't have DK weight minis, and can't afford to purchase them from Sharon. Um, I know that there are a few of you who are definitely on a budget, yarn budget, and you might have some fingering weight skeins that you could hold double in your stash. I want you to support Sharon, but that would be an option too, is just to hold um, some light fingering double in this section and, and pick a, or you could do this in worsted um, and it would just turn out a little bit bigger, so. There are lots of options for everyone to kind of come in. I was just so tickled that she thought enough of me to, you know, dye the colors and then, you know, send me them and then send me another kit so that we could photograph it. I did it um, on Joanna and um, there are the two kits on her website. And so knitstyleyarns.com and go watch Sharon and She's going to be talking about this cowl on her podcast this week, too. And I hope she has good things to say about her knitting experience because she did text me and say, oh, Corey, it really isn't hard. You're, it's just like you're changing color for a stripe. It, you're not carrying colors across. There's nothing like that. It's just flopping them out. So let me know what you think. Now let's take a look at this peasy sweater for the sweater of the week, okay? This is my peasy. It is by Heidi Kiermeyer, and it came out in 2009. It's knit in DK weight yarn, 22 stitches to four inches on a size four needle, and it calls for Rowan felted tweed, which is what I used. I bought green to make it in kind of a limey green, and then I changed my mind and went and did it in an orange. So I hope that you can see how lovely these really bright gumdrop buttons are on this. It is three quarter, um, link sleeves or bracelet link sleeves um, in the pattern and that does allow you to use less yarn but you could certainly make them longer and you could make the cardigan longer. Um, it has just a tiny little bit of lace here and that's it so not a lot going on but what I'm finding is I'm going to my closet these days and I'm saying I just need a plain cardigan. I have a lot of patterned stuff <laughs> To, to wear patterned shirts and tops and blouses and tunics, but not kind of a plain, the plain thing to kind of go over it. So this kind of fits that. Read you the description. A cropped cardigan with three quarter length sleeves worked in one piece from the top down, which means you can easily change the length. You could also add more buttons if you prefer a closed cardigan. Instructions are giving for working the sleeves flat, but they can be worked in the round if you prefer. It would be great in cotton or linen yarn for summer as well. Suitable for an adventurous beginner who understands top-down raglan construction, is not afraid of a little lace and picking up stitches for the trim. Requires knowledge of basic increases and decreases and a cable cast on. Here is a tutorial. So there's a video length and the sizes range from 32 extra small to 50 extra extra large. So there is a pretty good range of sizes there. It could you know, go up, but like I said, it's, uh, it's an older pattern and I had it in my queue and had wanted to knit it forever and just never got it knit. So that is the Peasy cardigan and I have been wearing it quite a bit this fall. I have a little note to share, a little tip or trick. I get Stephen B's newsletters and Stephen bombards you <laughs> with newsletters every week. You get one almost daily. But he had a um, an event at his um, shop 
for this, a new sock, circular sock machine is being made. So you don't have to buy the Erbacher, Erlbacher one. I don't have a circular sock machine and I know a lot of people could, can't afford them. But this is called True Knit and I went to the website a week ago because my life has been a little crazy and it wasn't available yet, but it looked like they were getting ready to sell them. And maybe they're doing like pre-orders. So I just wanted to tell you all about it. If any of you have ever looked at getting yourself a circular sock machine, you might wanna know about it. If you don't know what a circular sock machine is, it is a cranking machine that you put yarn through and it makes a tube of fabric and then you can just add heels, toes, and cuffs and crank out socks. And I have talked about that on the podcast before. Amber has one and she has cranked me some tubes. And several people out in the world will crank tubes for you at a, at a price. So that is something that you can look at doing. I wanna thank you all for your continued support of the Christina hat pattern. I have knit two more Christina hats to be used as samples at B Woolen, the local yarn store. I took a little trip up there with my knitting group uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, I was checking out this yarn because I was gonna make this for my mother. Um, I was gonna gift it to her, and I was thinking about doing it in mittens as well, and now I have been convinced that I need to do this as a cowl, so I'm working on a cowl pattern that will match this. It will, I think it will be more of a bandana type of cowl rather than a round cowl. This mohair has sequins in it, which is making it just sparkle even more. And I picked out the sequins and I thought it would be just too fun. So this is the folded brim option. Uh, and then this is the beanie version. I picked kind of a raspberry purple color, of course I did. So, and I have one more to knit in a different yarn that she chose that doesn't have the mohair in it. And I'll be dropping those off up there on Friday. And then I think I might be teaching a class on the Christina hat um, and how to place a bead on your knitting. So if you're local and you wanna make the hat in class, you can call B Woolen, the local yarn store up in Champlin and uh, take a look at that. So I have to preface this next little tip or trick um, or thing I have to tell you um, with a bit of a story. So I am cleaning out files from our basement. We have a huge unfinished basement that runs the entire length of our house and we don't have plans to finish it. But it has definitely been becoming part of a just put in the basement situation with everything. So empty boxes, car parts, storage, we just keep putting things down there. And occasionally we'll say, let's take a trip to the Goodwill or whatever and get rid of some stuff. But recently I have been feeling like, oh, we're just sitting on top of a huge pile of stuff we don't need. So I asked Ross to bring up files from when I was a teacher. I have been saving them for the last 20 years um, because the last time I taught, Kylie was three and uh, I thought at some point I may have to go back to teaching. I did go back to substitute teaching for a while, but then decided to not do that full time. And so he brought up boxes after box after box. Last must have been two weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon, I sat and I just went through and I kept just a few things, but I had files and files and files, units um, and really good materials, resources, um, worksheets, answer keys, all kinds of stuff. And I thought, this stuff doesn't change, like grammar, spelling, vocabulary, writing paragraphs, like some of that stuff doesn't change. Someone should use this. So I reached out on the Nextdoor app and Facebook and asked if there were any teachers that might want to come just pick it up before I like recycled seven boxes we had them in those clear sterilite boxes with white lids stacked on a shelf in the basement they were literally just taking up room so one of the files i found was my mother file do you all have a mother file when i was early on as a teacher i was told to keep a mother file and so i always had one one of those kind of open fi file folders that you is like an envelope with a wide bottom in the front of a file. 
And you put things in there when people write you something nice. When they say something nice, when they send you a card that touches you or makes you, you know, feel better about what you have going on. And so I, I had this mother file and it had cards and it had a couple of awards in it for way back when I was a cheerleading coach and a, uh, the president of the cheerleading association, I would get letters and there were some news clippings in there and just little things that I had done, you know, over the period of 50 years, or 40 years or whatever. And I it just kind of went through them briefly and I thought, oh, what a nice, thing to keep what a nice thing to look back at especially if you're having a down day or a bad day or something but there was one particular letter that i had had and i i may have talked this about this on the podcast before but oh a girl named Sus susanna wrote me a letter and i put it in this glass fronted piece and it got all um sun damaged and so it's underneath there but i i typed out her note to me and one of the saddest things that happened when I was a teacher was that my husband got transferred in July um, to Virginia. And we made the move to Virginia, which ended up turning out to be just a wonderful blessing for our family. But it was September of 2001 and 9-11 had just occurred when we were supposed to be moving to Virginia. But I didn't go back to school that fall and I didn't say goodbye to anybody. I didn't have a end of year party. I never had a retirement. It wasn't anything like that. We just called the school and said, I won't be back. I won't be filling my contract for the next year. And we moved. And the kids didn't get to have, you know, any knowledge of that. And I was working in an alternative program for at-risk youth, which many of you know, I did that for 17 years. And, you know, so many of those kids I would have year after year. But this is Susanna's letter to me. I was really disappointed when I heard that you won't be teaching here this year. I really enjoyed having you as a teacher. I think that you were the best teacher I've ever had, and I know many of your students feel the same. I haven't had a teacher that I really liked since fourth grade, so I was really happy to be in your class. I just want you to know how great of a teacher I think you are. I think it's so great that you're getting kids my age to read. Most of them think that reading isn't cool, so they don't do it. But after a little while being in your class, I noticed all of them are reading and being excited about it. I found so many of them who were really excited about reading a book and wanting to discuss it. I saw so many kids who thought it wasn't cool sitting and discussing a book and even recommending it to others. You really got kids interested in the work you had them doing. I really liked having you to ask my question about English or anything. English has always been my stronger side and I think you made it stronger. And for all other students who have a really hard time with English, you really helped them learn to like it. If it weren't for TAP, and that was the alternative program, we called it TAP, I would have dropped out in ninth grade and never tried again. And I wanted to thank you and everyone when I graduated, but since you won't be here, I wanted to thank you now. I really respect you as a person and as a teacher. Thank you so much for everything. You are not just a teacher to me, you are a friend. Thank you so much. On a down day, if you just change the life of one kid, right, as a teacher, you say that it's worth it. Sorry. <laughs> um, and that mother file was full of little notes from parents whose kids were living in a bus without electricity because they'd kicked them out for using drugs and from kids and from a principal and from my co-teachers um, some of them from my family. It was just a file full of uplifting stuff. And I wish I would have remembered that that file was in that box this summer when I was sitting in the chair feeling so down and so discouraged because I was so sick and I didn't feel like I was accomplishing anything. And, you know, nothing good was going to come of what was going on with me. And now, you know, you can kind of those are the moments that you want to cherish and kind of remember and feel like. And I am not trying to pat myself on the back. I was not the best teacher. Um, I now at 60, I wish I could go back and teach because in the last 20 years, boy, have I learned a lot about what I would do differently. Um, but I was always enthusiastic. <laughs> And I'm mostly a cheerleader, not always really good at discipline, <laughs> which some kids really need. Most of you know that if you follow me on Instagram, I've been doing these knitting tips and I do a little thing called Wednesday Wisdom. Sometimes I do a thing called Friday Funnies. 
Um, it's just to kind of make people think or to stop for a moment and, and give some gratitude or whatever, make people laugh. That's all I'm going for. But I schedule those out. I've talked about that, how I sit down and do them for like the next month. And one of the ones that's coming up um, is this one. And you'll see it. And it says, the kids who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving ways. And that was so true of many of the at-risk kids that I had the privilege of working with. Um, those kids made me laugh on a daily basis, but they could be so naughty <laughs> and so off-putting sometimes. Um, and they needed, they needed you more than the kid who was the really good student and could kind of handle things. Um, everybody's got something in their background, but boy, some of those kids had really been through through some hard knocks and going through that mother file, I thought, I hope everybody has a mother file. If you don't have one, start one. It's not too late. Get yourself a little file folder or a little box. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a little pretty cardboard box or something that you can throw notes or little comments in that people give you. Um, you could write down your own little Corey stories to remember um, those things by. But I just thought today, gosh, I should share that with the group of um, podcast viewers who might be feeling down about themselves or about something they, that's going on in, the, in their life or their situation. And you don't always know <laughs> that it's going to come out better on the other end. Uh, but I think most of you have some good things that you can remember, some good memories, some happy memories, some people who touched you and um, and did good for your soul. So I thought without the tears, I thought it would be uplifting, but apparently it just made me a little emotional to think about that time in my life. So thanks I'll give for you listening. one more reminder about going over to Kingdom Fleece and Fiber Works and checking out that little advent spinning calendar that she has. She's also going to be doing dyeing the yarn up eventually, but she has those calendars available. And my design is right over here. I'm going to give you just a tiny little sneak peek in the corner. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I have pictures taken of that, and uh, it is a design that will be going with that kit where you also get a bag and buttons. Um, and you get bumps of fiber each week all the way through December and then you can spin them up and knit them into my design. My design will also be available um, eventually online for everyone that would want to make it out of their own yarn or if you already have hand spun um, yarn. I'm knitting it up in another colorway of just not hand spun yarn so that there, there will be two samples. Um, I'm knitting as fast as I can on all these these projects every night until all hours but it is an Aaron to bulky weight um, project I use DK held double in the first sample and I'm using some chunky yarn what you know it's kind of in between Aaron and bulky is that chunky yarn um, and it's turning out kind of cute with that too so I just want to remind everybody that you should go over to Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks and check out that especially if you're a spinner because that's going to be a that would be a great Christmas present for yourself, right? <laughs> I want to tell you about a show I watched. The Cook of Castamar is on Netflix and I watched the whole first season super quickly and can't say enough good things about it. So it is subtitled um but they have overdubbed the the words so the people are speaking Spanish, I believe, but the words are English. And then I had subtitles on. I could have listened to it, but there are just times sometimes when you're not, when you can't tell, doesn't, didn't match up perfectly. Such a great story. Let me know if anybody else is watching The Cook of Castamar. Um, it takes place in a castle. It's a little, a, a little like Downton Abbey in that, um, it is the wealthy people who live upstairs and then the cook and the people who live downstairs and the goings on with them and what has happened. And 
there's a big tragic event at the beginning and then you figure out that the cook is going to come into the life of these people and it was just really good there were 12 episodes in one season um there was a little bit of sex and a little bit of violence so if you are offended by that but nothing nothing that i haven't seen before in some of some of these netflix series i would just say that it really kept my interest i could stay up late watching it and knitting and that isn't always the case about stuff that I find to watch on TV. I also want to start a little segment called Things I Have Seen on the Internet. Because this week, I saw this pattern, and I just thought it was so... You guys that have been watching for long enough know that I love innovation in knitting. I love it when people do take a a different take on something. They just do something different so that it's not all garter stitch triangular shawls and that's all we ever knit. I just like it that, and it is hard to find somebody that's not doing top down raglan, raglan top down heel flap and gusset, um, top down short row heel, toe up socks. You know, I mean, they're, it's all, the techniques are so similar, but look at this cute idea for a cowl. Can you imagine the things you would learn? This is by Flynn Knit. So cute. It is called the Cozy Cord Cowl, and she does mostly chunky knits. Lots of chunky hats, um, really big bulky things, and has a really appealing aesthetic on Instagram for her photos. <laughs> She lays things out and puts flowers and leaves and things around the outside and yeah. So just thought I would share that. Okay, for Corey's stories this week, I'm going to kind of assume that the beginning was part of the Corey stories and then I need to share, um, this is not gonna be uplifting and I'll try to make it, make it so, but um, about a month ago, my husband's cousin died of COVID and his aunt has lost her husband and her first son. Her first son died of AIDS, um, and she lost her husband a couple of years ago, and now she lost her only other son to COVID. And he left behind three high school and college-aged children. And two weeks ago, my cousin died of COVID. And I will just put this out that they were both unvaccinated and my parents came up last weekend for the visitation. Many of you will know that I'm a Christian and I'm not ever, ever going to push my faith on anybody. Um, and I have people of all different backgrounds that watch this podcast. Um, but today was All Saints Sunday. And um, in my church faith, which is liberal Lutheran, <laughs> um, we light a candle and so we lit candles and I know that there are a number of you who have shared things with me privately behind the scenes. You message me and tell me things that are going on with you and the struggles that you've had um, that have lost loved ones. And that moment of lighting that candle and we use tea lights, um, the little electrical ones in our church so that there aren't, there's not a ton of fire, <laughs> um, you know, going on everywhere. So there is a row of candles, but it was such a honoring moment and we all can have some of that right where we're just honoring the people who are blessings in our lives so maybe that is something that you would want to try to do no matter what your beliefs are is to have a candle in your house that your house that honors the saints in your life and a saint can just be anyone who is helpful. It, it, it doesn't have to have a religious connotation necessarily. It can be any person in your life that is helpful. Um, so I just thought I would, would share that here for any of those that, you know, that might, somebody might find that helpful. Um, my parents did drive up here um, last Wednesday. My brother drove them up and back all in one day. And that was a lot. They came with my cousin, Sandra, in the car. And, um, you know, like I said, it's like a three and a half hour drive. And then if they, the, the visitation was north of the Twin Cities here. And then they drove home that same day. And so at first, 
when my mom started not doing well, my dad and I kept saying, they're both just exhausted, right? They had just been up to the cities. My brother brought them back up, you know, up here, drove them back. It was a super long day. It was very emotional. My dad's older brother is not um, in the greatest of health, and he was, you know, visibly distraught. And my cousins were all there and distraught. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we kept telling ourselves. And so even though it's not necessarily uplifting or a great way... <laughs> To end the podcast, I thought I should just share that if you don't know anyone or of anyone, um, now you do or I have. So I want to wish all of you the best of the next two weeks. I have another pattern coming out. And then two weeks after that, I have a bunch of patterns coming out. I have a whole big sock collection coming out. Eight socks with a hat and a cowl to match. I am super inundated with work and I cannot thank my test knitters enough. So if you are a tester for me, I can't thank you enough for hanging in there with me through all this craziness. Um, so let's end today with keep it colorful, keep your fork. I love you all. We'll see you next time.